please don't suck, please don't suck, please don't suck, please don't suck. Ralph wrecks the internet. Well, um, it didn't suck. I do kind of wonder if I should have wished for something with a higher bar to clear that than that, though. So, oh boy, where do we start with this one? Okay, let me first be very upfront in acknowledging the fact that I went in not expecting to enjoy this. I have, well, I have either disliked or hated most of the marketing material that's come out in support of this film. Um, I am relieved to report that a lot of the stuff that um, even at the times that I did my reviews of those teasers and trailers that I kind of put an asterisk on and said it's possible that this is being created to look this way specifically for the trailer and it's not indicative of the way the film goes. A number of those moments where I said that about that turned out to in fact be the case. I think the easiest case in point is when they are uh, talking to the search engine and you know Vanellope's like, what's a website that's like totally awesome and crazy? And then he directs them to Disney. Yeah, that doesn't happen. That was it was cut together to look that way for the purposes of the trailer. So some of the some of the most egregious stuff that goes on in the trailers are, is not in the film. The thing that I hated absolutely the most out of anything I saw in the trailers is in the film in a way that actually really ticked me off because. <laughs> It wasn't in the film proper, and I thought, oh good, they thought better of it, and cut it. And then it was the mid-credit thing with the lead-in of, Mom, they didn't have a scene in that movie that was in the trailer. I didn't like that. And then they showed the thing that I hated so much. Ah! Like, I don't feel like it's a spoiler to say what scene that is, because it wasn't a trailer, but... No, it's not a spoiler, so I'm going to say, the scene with the, the kid, like a three-year-old, playing a game, and it's it's the bunny and the, and the cat, and it's the pancake, and the thing blows up, and the kid screams, like, childhood trauma's not funny! Bite me! I hate that. I, I hated that in the trailer, and I, like, movie ended, and I thought, oh, it's not in there, and then it was in the mid <sighs> okay, try and get try and get to a more positive place. I will have complaints. I will have nitpicks. I I do, I don't think I can help having this review. I mean that moment aside because I hate it. I I don't mean for this overall review to come across as negative as it's probably going to end up being. But ultimately, I can't help but dwell on what it is that keeps this from being as good as the first one, and that's probably what I'm going to spend the most time talking about. That should not be taken as an indication that the movie's terrible. It's not. As I said, it doesn't suck. Um, so, and there's a lot of stuff that is in there that is kind of smart and kind of clever. Some little moments, some bigger ideas. It just doesn't all quite come together um, in the way that the first one did. I will, however, also point out I took my daughter. She loved it. She thought it was great. She says she likes it a little bit more than the first one. Um, and when I asked her why her, I mean, she's at an age where it's not always easy for her to to nail down why she likes something. She just knows that she does. Um, but you know, what she said was she liked how much stuff there was. So I think she liked the greater variety of settings, of characters, of situations versus the first one. Because the first one was primarily, I mean, the biggest chunk of it is just set in Candy Crush. But even beyond that, it's not a ton of locations in the original. You know, it's Ralph's game. It's a little bit of time in the, um, in the station between games it's a tiny bit of time in Heroes Duty and then other than that it's pretty much all in in uh, Sugar Rush so you know it, it th this offers a much greater variety of set pieces and of characters and of bits it's it's not to the point of being like oh god they won't do one thing and say one place it you know it's not it doesn't have that sort of ADD effect so I, I get why that appealed to her and again she liked it a lot so uh, when it comes to will your kids kids like it well yeah Probably. Don't worry too much about that. So, where do we go with this from here? All right, I want to try and stay positive uh, for as long as I can, and which means that I'm probably not going to talk too much at the front end about Ralph himself, because a lot of my issues stem from him. Not that he is poorly portrayed or even necessarily poorly written. It's just the direction they chose to go with him, which is not, it's not like it doesn't make sense. I just feel like 
while it's a certain, to a certain degree, a natural progression to the character, it's something that feels very played out in general. And I can't really talk about that without getting into spoilers. And again, I'm trying to stay positive. Um, in general, though, I still like his vibe, but you know, and the chemistry between um, Ralph and Vanellope, that still works. We get some very cool uh, new characters, the big one being Shank, voiced by Gal Gadot. Um, who is a racer in what looks to be a sort of GTA Online sort of game. And so she's very cool, and Vanellope immediately lo is looking up to her massively because, you know, really cool kick-butt lady racer in this crazy insane game. So yeah, that's, that's cool, and that also lends probably the best action sequence, which is some of the racing stuff that goes on there. Um, the actual sort of visualization in general of the internet is pretty good. Actually, it's pretty neat. It's not my favorite. I think that'll probably still go to Oz from Summer Wars, but it is, it is very cool and it's very neatly done. I also want to point out that, like, unlike, say, the Emoji Movie, while this does cite specific real-world websites, by and large, anything that is truly plot-relevant, with the exception of Disney's own site, but... Disney owns it, whatever. Um, the the things that are truly plot relevant are not real world sites. So there's a chunk of the thing spent not on YouTube, but on BuzzTube. I think Buzz even has three Zs. Um, you know, they don't they don't search through Google, they search through knows more. So that, you know, I do appreciate that. And initially part of me was like, I, I kind of wish they weren't referencing the real names at all. But then I think about it and I'm like, you know what? That's not as big a detriment as like we tend to think. Cause I mean, yeah, at the time that I watched it, it was kind of oddly quaint seeing um, Blade Runner with, you know, big things for like Atari and, and you know, Coca-Cola and what and whatnot. But the thing was, is that at the time the film was made, those were contemporary, you know, sizable companies. So there's no reason that that actually has to date it specifically. So like the present, but literally just an image of Google, Twitter, Snapchat, whatever. Don't care. It, again, it's not emoji movie levels. It's not like we're going to stop and explain how this website works and don't you wish you could spend time with this thing that we basically stopped and did a, a complete sponsorship for. It's absolutely not that. I've seen more than a few reviews basically say it's like the emoji movie was good and that's not inaccurate, but I do feel like it's shortchanging this movie because that the, the whole thing that the Emoji Movie got bogged down in, which was highlighting all these specific apps and junk, that's just, this movie just doesn't do that. It spends time in programs and websites that mean something to the plot, but if it doesn't have a use for the plot, they don't stop there for more than like a quick visual gag. Um, so, you know, the, all that was fine, pretty well thought out, all things considered. Uh, eBay gets a bit of a highlight, but, you know, uh, for, again, for how the plot is going to move forward, it's actually a reason that it would be eBay, so, like, that's fine. Um, so all of that uh, works pretty well. The, there, there are some interesting... There's some interesting sort of theming in terms of where the relationship between Ralph and Vanellope is that, again, I don't think is a bad call in and of itself, but I'll come back to why it's it kind of kneecaps the thing overall. But I, I'm, I'm down with the choices that were made in principle. I just, yeah, I'll get to that. Um, the Disney princesses, actually, um, they do get more than just that one scene that was in the trailer. Um, and the sort of seeing Vanellope integrate with them was kind of cool. Um, they picked on Ariel a little bit more than I would have liked, but that I'm biased. I really love the Little Mermaid. But I, it, it, I say picked on her. They weren't unfair. They weren't really unfair to any of them. Uh, and the, the princesses actually do get a little bit more than just that one scene, including some really neat sort of ways in which they are visualized and come together and, and things like that. So actually, I, they were used better than I thought they would be as far as marketing, marketing goes. And they even get a little bit of mileage out of some of the other Disney stuff that uh, they own. They... There was a really cool placement of a, of a Wilhelm scream, for instance, and, and I won't spoil how that joke works, but that that I quite liked. Um, I think though I need to I need to start moving on to some of the things that I, again I don't want to say these don't 
work? Because they do, but I just got to start explaining. So this is where it's going to start to get into spoilers. It's not bad. It by no means ruins the previous movie. If you have little kids, they'll probably love it. And if you're not as nitpicky and overanalytical as I am, you'll probably like it more than I did. There you go. Consider that a recommendation for a movie that I myself don't feel that I ever need to see again. Weird as that might be. So getting into spoilers now. Okay, so major theme for the first one. This is a theme that connects with me in general. I mean, if you've seen anything like the list I did of 10 movies that always make me cry, which the original Wreck-It Ralph was actually my number one on that spot. A big thing for me that always connects with me is people making connections. More specifically, people who think that they can't connect with others then managing to do that. And that it was really in many ways the through line with Ralph. It had a lot of things going on in terms of relating to other people, finding ways to relate to people, but also coming to terms with yourself. And everything kind of fed into that theming because you have Ralph who knows his place in the world but is resentful of it um, because he doesn't like being the bad guy anymore. You have Vanellope who doesn't know her place in the world because she knows what she feels like she is, which is a racer, but that world won't welcome her. So she's sort of at a loss because she knows what she thinks she is, but it's, it's not working that way. And then as the villain in that, you have Turbo, who is somebody who has decided he's going to reshape the world to force it to be what he wants it to be so that he can have the role he wants. Rather than taking any sort of acceptance of what his place is, he said, no, I will literally break the world in order to have the hold the position that I want to hold. So everything about it, your two main characters, your primary conflict, the way the world was threatened, and your villain all fed into this common thing. Theme. And that sort of unifying central core isn't really here uh, in in uh, Ralph Breaks the Internet. It's not totally absent of theming, but that's part of where I'm going to come back to something I talked about earlier. So the main thing that things move ahead on is they are leaning much more heavily. They use the term best friends, but in terms of thematically, it's very clear that they are leaning very heavily on Ralph and Vanellope as a father-daughter relationship. Um, and, and that's made, and that's not me projecting, that's like made explicit at a number of points, like to the point that it's singled out that, you know, Ralph is doing dad humor. Um, you know, they they point out that, you know, they've been friends now for six years, and that's kind of a significant number because what happens when kids become six years old? They start going to school. They start going to first grade. Now, I mean, you know, your kids will go to kindergarten and whatnot before that, but really first grade feels like a big deal, and that does often feel like the point at which you are sort of losing them a little bit, and Ralph having now been with Vanellope for six years, feels like she is drifting away from him. And he has put an awful lot of stock and an awful lot of his sense of self into this relationship that he has with her, which is also a thing that parents tend to do with their kids. It's part of what having your kid grow up to and start to do their own thing, whether it be school, meeting friends that, you know, maybe are not what you um, idealize as being the, your child's future or going off to college or what have you, a lot of that sort of pressure and those sorts of weights are laid onto Ralph. And like I said, it's it makes sense in terms of a progression for the way Ralph's sort of relationship and his character flaws work. The problem, though, is, is that this is much more well-trodden ground, especially in animation. Because the way in which this ultimately manifests are the things, well, mistakes and stupid things that Ralph does trying to ensure that Vanellope doesn't leave. In other words, you know, to stretch out the metaphor, trying to control his daughter figure. And this is really, really well-worn ground in, uh, well, in films in general, in animation especially. It, you know, you can go back to things like The Little Mermaid. I may love it, but, you know, that that is what kicks off everything going downhill as a father trying to control his daughter's future. That is basically the entire through line of the Hotel Transylvania series. And there's a whole bunch of others. I'm, I'm not coming up with them off the top of my head, but like this is not new territory. So that that's an unfortunate thing where even though they took Ralph in a 
direction that is logical and is consistent and unfortunately puts him in a place where thematically what's going on is not nearly as unique as what was happening in the previous film or at least it felt much more unique to me in the previous film because of the the combination of self-acceptance and and acceptance from other people and the way that all folded together here we're getting a narrative where a father figure goes, oh my god, I'm gonna lose my daughter, and then does something really stupid and really just not nice to try and force her to stay with him. And that's, again, that is not new, especially lately. Like, it really feels like in the last few years that that's been, that's been hammered on a lot. So that, that doesn't help. And then, you know, like I said, you, you can look at the at the villain of the first one. You can look at Turbo. And I know a lot of people are very over the whole sort of hidden villain thing that animated films, Disney especially, has been doing lately. Um, I do think Turbo is one of the better executed ones of those, though, because it is highly thematic overall to what's going on um, in terms of why he operates the way that he does. You know, that he is sort of the extreme version of what is the worst thing that Ralph could become in his effort to, you know, want to say he gets to be what he wants to be. And to go from that, where he's combating what is, a, a you know, a fully formed character to Ralph Breaks the Internet, where he is very literally fighting a monster made of his own anxieties. It's a little clunky. It's a little on the nose, and while it doesn't seem to have bothered my daughter, I can't help but think that that big Ralph anxiety monster is going to be literal nightmare fuel for a lot of kids. It's it's actually really unsettling. It, kind of a cool idea, but like, I don't know, dude. It's like, yeah. Um, and the other, and but that's another thing, is that the, this movie kind of has to pull a tangible threat for the climax kind of out of its butt. Because up to that point, it keeps shifting gears for what it for what the story it's telling is. Because initially we are looking at, well, the you know, the characters are settling into a routine and Vanellope's a little restless. Okay, that's our starting point. Ralph tries to help and then breaks stuff. Annoying, um, and also a little bit repetitive, given what happened with him in the in the first film. But okay, now Vanellope's game is in jeopardy. Oh, okay, a little bit of a retread, but okay, that's how we get to the internet. Trying to find a way to get the things we need to fix the game so she doesn't lose a game. She herself says she wants to save the game, that she doesn't want it to go away. But then she finds something new. So now it's a clash between Ralph, you know, being able to let her go. And then literally because Ralph decides to be the most deliberately selfish I think that he's ever been, like knowingly selfish, he decides to unleash this virus so that we can have um, a physical threat in the climax. And it, it really does feel like a bit of a hard right turn. It doesn't come completely out of nowhere, but it really does feel something shoehorned in for the sake of a more traditional climax. Because, I mean, again, to compare it to the first movie, you look at, like, the cybugs. The cybugs get established fairly early into the film. And then the, the threat of them and the fact that they are still around, we get a couple of reminders across the film. So when they erupt at the end, even if it's been a while since we've seen them, you go, oh crap, that's right. And now we have to deal with that. Whereas here, the virus literally gets introduced over an hour into the film. Like there, there was no hint of any sort of real, of a physical, tangible threat. The threats were, for lack of a better term, more existential for the most part. They were about this relationship and, you know, about the idea of is Vanellope going to have a home? They were more abstract threats. And then, like, two-thirds of the way into the movie, the final boss threat gets introduced out of nowhere, basically. So, you know, it, and, and again, I, it also bothers me how much Ralph backpedals. It doesn't feel like it completely undoes his character growth from the first film. And it's handled well enough that, that it's not a complete regret, regression. It doesn't feel like they retcommed his development. But there is something irritating to me on a personal level that I really do think that he acts 
way more selfishly here than he did in the original film. Because in the original film, he acts selfishly, but he gets tunnel vision on what he wants and doesn't really seem to, well, he just doesn't stop and think about what the consequences to other people will be. Once he realizes what they are, he starts to realign what he's doing. Here, he makes a choice where he knows that she is not gonna like him for doing this and that it's potentially very dangerous and does it anyway. That, like, that's a, that's a new level of selfish for him. And again, I, I get it. Like, thematically, I get it. You know, the, the lengths that um, it feels like some parents go to in an effort to keep their children close to them. Um, but, you know, it's, 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 just, it's just frustrating for me overall. And that's kind of the, the viewing experience of this in a nutshell. I kept seeing things that I'm like, that's a good idea. That's a good way to handle that. And then seeing other things where I'm like, oh, yeah. So, you know, it's a mix and a balance. And again, if you're not as overly analytical as I am, if you're able to sort of turn your brain off a bit <laughs> more than me and, uh, and, you know, just sort of have the experience wash over you, it's not a bad experience. It's not a bad viewing experience. It is a fairly fun movie. I just, you know, I can't, I can't stop my brain from comparing it to the first and seeing the ways in which it's not as consistent, coherent, and as... Um, well layered as the first film was so I mean that's it for me I I don't <sighs> this strikes me as, as the kind of opinion that I that there's going to be a decent amount of comments you know telling me how I completely misread the situation or I got it wrong or that I read way too much into it which you know fair but is what it is. So, Ralph Breaks the Internet. Have you seen it? What do you think about it? Whatever your thoughts are, drop something down in the comments. Let's talk about it. A whole bunch of stuff you can do because there's buttons and links and you can, you know, go places and do things like go to my Patreon, support me there if you feel like uh, doing so. If you don't, don't worry. Other links you can check out. Don't want to look at them? That's fine too because at the end of the day, folks, you're the council. I just run the meetings. And until next time, this council is adjourned. Thank you.